and uh, today I have the great honor of interviewing Lynn Baez, um, Director of Facility Operations at Google, and we're going to have a great conversation around um, Google's ambitions in support of ESG and a number of fascinating topics. But first, Lynn, I would just like to ask the question of, of who are you and what are you passionate about? Oh, thanks so much. And thanks for the opportunity. I'm excited to have the dialogue today. Um, I am the director of facilities um, for Google. I, I reside in the Bay Area in California. So I oversee the properties in several cities um, in Silicon Valley. And you know, my role is really the strategic direction of facilities and operations teams. And I've worked at Google now for three and a half years. I support a number of our employee resource groups, including our Latinx Leadership Council, um, OLA, which is for our uh, Hispanic population, and then our Black Googler Network. You know, it's really a passion of mine to promote and foster inclusion um, in our organization. So I've been really thrilled and excited to be able to lead in those efforts there. You know, I appreciate in the role of FM, really inspiring fellowship and building bridges with all of the teams, which is part of my core role and in a highly complex workspace. You know, I get the opportunity to deliver the impossible and ensure our vendor operate uh, operations teams are delivering an extension of what we believe is a cutting edge workplace experience. So I've been in this industry about 20 years, done all different kinds of buildings. Um, the one, the two buildings I have not done uh, are uh, airports and stadiums, but I did actually get to fulfill one of those two recently where now I manage a Moffat airfield here in Silicon Valley. I've been within IFMA uh, over 20 years as well and been able to support this industry through a lot of committee and chair and board membership. So I'm really excited today to talk about um, ESG, what that means, what that means for Google and the role I play in it. So super excited to be here today. Well, that's fantastic. And and we just saw the your CEO's message, uh, Sundar Pichai's uh message about um, what Google is doing to support ESG. Um, and could you describe a little bit more, provide a little bit more detail about what that means and what does it mean for your role? Sure, absolutely. And I'll say the key message you heard there was helpfulness. So that's a passion of mine, right? To be helpful, not only for those that I represent within my own team, but also for the globe as, as, as an entirety, right? Helpfulness is at the cornerstone of what Google represents. So I'm really proud and excited that we can be so helpful in the ESG space. As you can see in my own backyard, this is Mountain View behind me. Um, we have the dragon scales up um, from what he was mentioning. And as he mentioned, we'll be generating seven megawatts of clean energy just in this space alone. The space isn't quite opened yet for Googlers. We're putting the finishing touches on the interiors right now. I really am excited for when our Googlers join the space very, very soon. You know, I'm really proud of representing an, a firm that really leads in terms of the E and the S and the G. You know, with the first of its kind in uh, North America of wind and solar, and now here at this property for geothermal types of power. You know, I, I would say a core moonshot of Google is to be helpful for everyone. It allows us the opportunity to, to lead in terms of social and governance as well. You know, as I mentioned, we're putting the finishing touches here. One of the key elements is assurance that we provide diversity, equity, inclusion for all that actually use this space every day. So how we operate our user journeys, the way we create and drive the most helpful opportunities for day-to-day -day experiences really ensures that there's significant accountability in the FM space to do this. We have all kinds of councils and groups of all different kinds of people, and we ask them to what we call here dog food, the, the spaces before our Googlers enter. I am dog fooding right now, which means I'm sitting in this space for the last couple of months to really understand its day-to-day -day operations because we believe in a user-first mindset, and that's how we build all our spaces. In terms of governance, how we procure, source, and utilize the spaces really is beyond just typical regulatory needs, right? I would say our tip, a typical firm would be looking at a compliance-driven mindset in terms of governance. 
we really think how else can we be helpful to set the precedent across the globe in terms of governance instead? Well, I, I mean, there's so many fascinating topics that you you touched upon in that in that that description there. One of the things I think about is your process of dog fooding as you talk as you described it. And I know when you have a new build like this, there's always uh, kinks in the in the process that that emerge that need to be addressed. What are some of the things that that have kind of caught you by surprise in this in this new build process and rolling it out and making sure that it's ready for your Googlers? Oh my gosh! Well, you know, in terms of when you're opening a space that is one of its kind in the planet, right? You really need to think about a few things. The first is. Um, being lockstep from initial design, creation, then when we do surrender and turnover, ensuring that our vendor partners, um, all of our organization is educated on the global intent of what this space is supposed to deliver. We consider this a living lab, right? So we consider experimentation part of our daily operation. So really having that user journey throughout from creation to inception to delivery to now operation and all the teams throughout that within real estate and workplace services, which is the organization I'm in, it's a core part of what we do every day. How do we do things in comparison to what we do is how we deliver the spaces that we create. And I would say in terms of an FM perspective, gaining that full momentum from that origination stage to understand that operation and execution is key. A good example of one area would be shading and lights, right? Thinking about all that beautiful light that's coming in behind me right now, middle of the day here in the Bay. How do we ensure that we don't have glare issues? How do we ensure that traffic patterns for users throughout really are well illuminated and that also we're having the appropriate wayfinding to get people where they need to go? If we don't think about how we deliver in that space from a conceptual perspective, you know, We have architectural firms and other groups that might have a great idea. If we anchor to that idea and how we operate it, then we know that we can iterate throughout. So I would say we're going to continue to iterate in spaces new like this. And then also I run about 150 buildings that are not as new and pretty as this that we've had in our portfolio for about 20 plus years. And thinking about how we retrofit that experience to equal or surpass the one that's here is a challenge I love every day. So I love that aspect that you start talking about because you're using terms that you don't often hear in the facility management industry. You're talking about iterating, piloting, almost the building as a living concept. Um, I mean, that's got to drive some some really interesting conversations that you have with with management. Can you describe some of the things that that are important for them and how that shapes your work? Absolutely. You know, I, I would say really thinking about um, what that ROI is. And for us, it's not about just a fiscal savings. I think um, there's been some inquiry about, is this type of facility going to generate savings? And I would tell you, that's not really what we're thinking about. We're thinking about reinvestment. Does this in- meet the intent of our global sustainability goals, right? Are we really trying to get to carbon neutral by, 20, by 2030? Are we really trying to be carbon free by that point as well? Are we living what we're saying? And that's the type of business cases I need to continue to bring when we operate it to say, okay, we may have a talent base to support geothermal, which is what is in this building. That's a bit unique for our profession. It may, the talent pool may not be readily available. We might need to train folks on this option and have that as part of their core skill sets in our technical spaces, in our, you know, management of our HVAC, our MEP, in our core and shell are not typical elements here. And knowing that that um, the, the talent pool for that would be pretty scarce, right? So how do we continue to deliver a holistic perspective in use cases and business cases to our senior leadership teams to help them understand our core message of being helpful, right? So mm-hmm. if, and I would give a, you know, some consideration to others that are in this industry thinking about how would I do something like this in my space? It's really anchoring back to the mission, the vision that your entity has and saying, let's anchor our financials, our operating models to support this. And that's where we can see real value generation take flight. It may not be in 
And for us, I would say in energy consumption, it's been amazing, right? We Going neutral is fantastic um, that I can really be able to provide the data to support this. But as far as cost savings, for, for example, we might not see a, a generation of that for a little bit just because we want to continue to iterate its operation and its intended use. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I see one aspect, particularly for Google, because so much of your, the energy consumption, of course, it comes from your data centers, other aspects. So decarbonizing or, or moving yes. towards uh, carbon free energy, you know, you know, there's a direct linkage. So the work that you're doing, you know, piloting geothermal, piloting these alternative uh, uses of energy, you know, having a dragon scale uh, system put up on, on the roof of your building is something that's a test case that could be rolled out in other parts of, of the operation. One, one thing I'll bring up here on that case, I, and I think it's earlier in the video. So for those that haven't gotten a chance mm -hmm. to look at it, it's free on YouTube. Go check it out. Um, is the fact that we actually are building a lot of algorithms to help us on our load shedding. This is one area any entity could really do frankly, is taking a much more data-driven approach in how we manage our and consume our energy and really thinking about those key hours, right? Load shedding for most entities, especially through BMS systems, kind of is a clunky process at best. And sometimes you don't really get the information that you're looking for. Looking at true analytical perspectives of how you consume things and then how you can change the operating model for that consumption can really drive some significant savings as well as reduction of your energy footprint. So it's a really fantastic data-driven way that we're really being helpful, I think, not only for Googlers, but also for the, the globe as a whole and where this space can go next. So, so the question I have, um, you know, it's this fascinating discussion about how data-driven um, you as an organization, Google writ whole, but then also in the FM um, space. And you're talking about this aspect of, of the industry as a whole is shifting to becoming much more data driven than it ever has been before. But my conversations with many FM um, specialists is that they point towards um, a struggle that they see in the industry around being data driven and understanding what data analytics actually means and how it changes the FM role. And so I'm interested to hear about your perspectives on that and what your journey within Google um, could be used as kind of a, an example or some of the things that you've learned in that process that could be relevant for others who are starting out on this. A few things there. I would say build a huge tribe. And the reason why I say it that way is from the onset of what, let's say we're dealing with a brand new space, right? From the onset of what the technical design specifications were for that building, there's a big tribe of industry professionals that helped you build that space and what the intent is supposed to be. Really not only leveraging those types of analytics through the onset of design and then potential construction, but using the same partners through operation is key. One area I think that's a phenomenal opportunity for FMers is leveraging folks that have done the technical specs for your building and saying, let's keep them on past TCO, right? Let's keep them on past commissioning and say, let's manage that relationship year in one, because then we get to see the rubber meeting the road, right? Of how this building operates, how it functions. And now that we've done a million, what we call day two things, right? To make the um, occupants feel safe and comfortable. And especially now through the pandemic where we're adding in more types of indoor air quality, more occupant comfort, more feeling safe as well as being safe, right? To the space, engaging more of the analytics throughout to see how the building um, bends and shifts to meet mm -hmm. those requirements, that gives you a really strong baseline on year one. In retrofitted buildings, that's a little bit more challenging, right? Because some of those folks have all gone home and now you're dealing with the space that you're trying to develop and, and change. And doing a tremendous amount of baseline studies to understand all the different functions, doing your, your um, life cycle cost analysis on all of your equipment to get that strong foundation of what the building is intended to be. And then you're going to flex it to what it's going to be next. So thinking about how you bring through your technician's journey, right? Those operations of the systems and controls, but also through your facility coordinators, facility staff, how they're going to articulate that messaging. If we at FM have become a now the voice of what workplace represents on the ground 
right? For many C-suite individuals, they could have very exciting goals of and moonshots of where they're trying to go. But it's the FM that's delivering and carrying that message to, to all of your occupants every single day. So if you give articulation of the why as well as the what through all the data, it really helps deliver the intended outcome. So I would urge all FMs to really think about the why and the what as much as the how. Okay, well, thank you for that. And it gets me into that conversation that, that you had this moonshot that in the mm -hmm. video was brought forward of saying, our goal is to be carbon free energy by, by 2030. Oh, and so goodness. I'm sure that ambition, given the, the type of facility that you're managing, that that's <laughs> one of the key indicators you're tracking. Um, you know, how does that influence the way that you're working, the way that your analytic strategy is done? Yeah. Uh, there's you know, two key elements. Oh my gosh, Jeffrey, you know, it's a great question because it's super exciting to me, right? Because I get to live in both spaces in this, in this area, one with existing footprint and then others in new spaces through construction. So there's two key ways we're doing it. The first is on-site generation, like here with geothermal and also through solar. And there's also um, purchasing of carbon-free energy in other markets where this may not be available. I mean, I think as you can tell in Silicon Valley, there's not always a lot of space to actually build many more. So we got to think of what we can do in the spaces that we have. And looking at the electricity market level and designing our buildings and spaces to match that hourly consumption rate when it is at its cleanest, right? We know that a lot of generation farms throughout the globe have those peak hours when the energy is at its cleanest, really looking at our operating models to, to meet that demand, to, to manage that peak and that load. So I would say those elements are the ways that we're looking at getting to carbon free by 2030. Okay. Yeah, and, and I see that there's, you, you've spoken to the algorithms, which is a software component. Mm -hmm. And I know the FMers that, uh, and the audience, many of them are very engineering oriented. I'm sure there's oh, some yes. interesting infrastructure and inter very interesting and fascinating engineering that's been done on the site and so just so i can understand like so is all the energy that you need produced on site or do you have aspects where you're also maybe selling off energy to the grid yes. or doing components like that so can you speak a little all bit of about that. Some of those components all, all of, of it, it. Okay, um what i would say too is i also think we we really partner with our a communities, right? So we really think about the generation that's required, not just in the place we serve, in the box we're in, but the community around us. So to your point about sell-off, there are opportunities for that as well. We also look at site-level implementation plan to get the systems installed, especially in places where retrofitting, right? And then if we're um, creating more than what we need, we definitely give it to the buildings that, that are available around us. One thing that I'll, I'll bring up is also it's not just in our in our carbon space. It's also in our utilization of um, in in how we deliver water as well, and use of water, and where we can manage those resources. So we really think about it in a holistic perspective. We partner significantly with the cities that we're in to see what crisis areas they are a part of, and how we can help be helpful in that space too. Yeah, so it sounds like you're operating into urban FM for those uh, academics in the audience who have that focus about that that connection oh, and how you think about your FM, not just building centric, but community centric and precinct or neighborhood centric as well. I'll, I'll speak two seconds on that. You know, right now I'm in the middle of a lot of new spaces in our communities and we are no longer building just individual buildings. We're building spaces that are multi-use that spaces are available for communities so that there can be retail, there can be um, nature walks and bike trails, and that people can reside in these spaces and help our affordable housing in some markets, right? We all hear that Silicon Valley is a pretty expensive place to be in the world. Um, and how do we help be more helpful in this space by providing opportunities for residential that are much more um, affordable and equitable to all? So I would say it's exciting to go. I always tell people I'm much more of a city manager than an FM manager these days um, because the amount of complexity and scale is super exciting to be able to be, to, to lead. That's I mean, I, I'm fascinated because that's super impactful. And I, I think that's quite fascinating. And, and you know, again, you're, you're talking it's not just a. Um, 
an energy component, there's also the other elements of your environmental footprint that are important. So waste, water, all these aspects that mm -hmm. come into play. And, and it's interesting to hear about that, that focus. And, and, you know, you have this ambition or, or, or being a carbon neutral building and having carbon neutral buildings. Can you speak some more about that ambition and how right. you're actually doing it? Because one aspect is, of course, reducing the, the impacts of what you're sourcing in. The other aspect of maybe doing offsets um, or a combination of the two. Um, I, so can you speak a little bit about that? Definitely. It's and it's a lot to what we're talking about already. It's setting the right baseline of what either we think we're going to generate or what we are generating, depending on the building, if it's new or existing, right? And then looking at methodology to say, what is the offset that gets us to neutral? Is it purchasing? Is it generation? Is it um, engagement in operational efficiencies that we could we facilitate and manage? You know, one of the things that we've been thinking about in every space, and now we've done through the pandemic is change our filtration to MERV 15s, right? In some cases that might make the, the equipment run at a, at a higher rate, right? To be able to help that filtration modeling. In other cases, it actually helps it operate better, right? And we go and look at our operational frequencies, our adjustments, and how do we deliver that, especially from set point adjustments, small things we can do. Once we do all of the analytics to get us to that neutral state, then we go, okay, let's think of a nice wiggle room just in case the building changes its intent, right? We know that buildings can turn into all different kinds of things. And we want to make sure that we give ourselves the space there to hit that neutrality. We know that we're going to be able to fix on the intent of a space, work through its life cycle, and be able to stay neutral throughout. So that's that's really the life cycle approach that we're taking in this space. So we're doing all the operational efficiencies throughout of its life cycle at the onset, really thinking of the design of what we can get to neutrality with what we can deliver or what we can produce. And then at, at the closure of the building, when we're thinking of doing the next thing, um, really thinking about how we can translate that neutrality as we go forward. Uh, so that's quite fascinating. I could imagine with all these micro adjustments that you're doing on the fly or on the go, that the building will be completely different. If you look at it from the interior space in like five years, six years, seven years from, from now. Absolutely. And, and even on a core and shell, right? Even on the, on, the, on the footprint it serves could be completely different. You know, most of us might have parking lots. We might want to convert it for um, light rail or, or convert it for more bike and walking paths, right? We, we really have taken concerted effort there to give as much equality in that space of utilization of transit as we can, wherever we, we are in the world, right? We consider, you know, all of all different means just as equitable as um, typical mass transit. So, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a really neighborhood perspective on how you can maintain neutrality of a, of a building's use. This is, I mean, I, I I find all of this so so deeply interesting, and I also think with the uh, the aspect that we have come not I wouldn't say coming out of the pandemic because as we could see what's going on. Um, around the world that the the pandemic is very much front and center and other countries are, are are going back into um lockdown or or different aspects but uh around that but you're in the you're in the phase where you're coming back and having a return to occupancy if we want to say that and and how are you progressing on on those plans and what considerations are you bringing uh bring to bear and, and your approach to bringing Googlers back to your site and introducing them to this entirely new site that you're Oh building. my gosh. So that's a great question. You know, um, I would say we've done a very uh, purposeful and health driven perspective over the last two years. Google has been very um, deliberate and purposeful in ensuring that we have the right health signals and data signals to make sure that it's safe for our people to return. And we've done that in a very conservative manner by allowing those that were most critical to our business and providing them the opportunities to be safe in the spaces that they were going to be returning in. And then as we have provided voluntary work from home options um, throughout the pandemic, those that needed to be here or wanted to be here, we were able to provide them that experience that they needed. Now we'll be getting into our hybrid model where those that may have been in 
working from their homes and been um, outfitted with the tools and materials that they needed to work the last two years will now be returning back into a workspace. And we, we have really built a lot of campaigns around feeling safe as well as being safe and giving people the opportunity to, to be comfortable in utilization of face coverings and, excuse me, having accessibility for sanitization methods. Even if the jurisdiction says, you know what, you guys are in a good place right now. We, we think you can come back and your occupancy level can rise. Great. We're going to make people feel that that's still okay as well as much as it is okay to do that. And um, I think that model will serve us well in the way that we'll be bringing folks back very, very soon into our spaces across the globe. We're about 30 different cities will be in that um, hybrid model very soon. So we're here. We're one of them. And I'm looking forward to seeing folks have a higher occupancy level as we've had. It has increased, you know, week over week. Um, folks that are curious and excited to return. So we're going to have some what we call surprise and delight experiences for them to help that um, casual interaction and engagement be spurred on. Right. We're going to make sure that people can feel welcome and excited to return to the places that make them most productive. I, I think that event component would be quite important to think about how do you celebrate yes. that return and turn it into a moment of celebration. And I think also about some of the processes that you put in place and the, the kind of the signal value of, you know, particularly the cleaning and sanitation component of having people do visual clean so people could see that it's actually being um, oh, cleaned yes. at, at, as they're going through the day. Communication is, is critical in this space, I would say, and the change management piece, I think, too, that you're talking about, right? And making sure sources of truth, like we call it here, are evident and available and that it is real time as we can give it to people, right? I mean, we know that most people will click on what's going on. Let's just click Google and see what's happening, right? So if we're trying to give that real time perspective to the, the, the climate that people will be returning in, we need to do that for our own teams as well, right? For our own Googlers and be able to give them means and methods to be able to understand um, their day-to-day, -day, their user journey, all of the things that have changed for the better and things that have stayed the same and make Google Google, right? So we want to be able to help them on their user journey throughout. We've built them a lot of tools and methods and means to help them understand and navigate what that day will look like when they're back. Oh, fantastic. I, you know, I want to say thank you for these insights and shifting a little bit of gears away from Google to the broader FM industry. Sure. One question that I like to have is this discussion about neglected conversations. So you've been involved in IFMA, you've been involved in the industry going on to, you know, 20 years now. And you're a, you know, a thought leader that when people want to say, hey, what's going on and what should we focus on? Everybody says, hey, you should speak to Lynn. <laughs> so I love to hear your insights on what you think are some of the conversations that we should be having as an industry, but aren't. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad, I'm glad we're going to kind of close our discussion today on this topic because it's super exciting to me to have my my perspective resonate out here for the group is that we have diverse spaces. We need diverse talent. And I would say IFMA has been phenomenal in looking at how do we build that right pipeline? How do we provide the right credentials through each part of the, of the FM's journey to help them navigate this very iterative profession that we're in, frankly, uh, what we would have considered core parts of our role 20 years ago are now supplemental and almost sometimes the ticket of entry of an of a opportunity in comparison to a differentiator. And I would say, as we progress through our talent, we need to think about not only expanding outreach and opportunity and severe and succinct mentorship and sponsorship, but also thinking about it through each element of the journey of the FM. We need more FMs at senior roles and senior levels. We need to be taking the seat that has been given to us through this pandemic and really leading the charge of where the C-seat wants to go next with their real estate footprint. Many teams are grappling with this question right now. 
And I would say we're not spending enough time and energy in this space to lend itself to the point of view of the FM. And I would say we can really provide significant support and leadership in this space of helping entities decide what they want to do next. If we don't cultivate the talent base to have those types of strategic discussions, we're giving our entities a disservice in the value that we can bring. So to me, I really feel like this is a topic we need to bring up more. How do we articulate what is next that we can deliver and provide that diverse viewpoint based on the buildings that we serve? So to me, that's where I hope we can get to one day and look forward to being part of that journey and really walking the talk in that space. So thank you so much, Jeffrey, for the time today. It's been great. Oh, thank you, Lynn. I mean, it's just been a fascinating journey into yeah, a fascinating person and also a fascinating organization that Google is with. I got to say a fantastic background view <laughs> as well. The light fall, light fall has been fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us today. And on behalf of IFLA and the RC organization, I would just like to say um, thank you so much. And to all of you who have been watching and engaged with us, have a fantastic rest of the conference and day. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully in other um, um, opportunities and other uh, conferences and engagements.